All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, CP the Franchise here. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Uh, today's show, we have Adam Cribley. He is the author of Kings of the Garden, the New York Knicks, and their city. And it is set to be released on April 15th. And he is also a professor of Southeast Missouri University. Adam, welcome to Knicks Fan TV. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me, CP. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, d- take us through your 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 Knicks origin story. What did, what did the New York Knicks mean to you coming up as a kid? You know, it's funny. So, I grew up in Ohio, um, not anywhere near anywhere near New York, but uh, I was a big video game player. And when the game Tecmo NBA Basketball came out in I don't know eighty nine ninety or whatever, like the Knicks were my squad. Like that's who I ran with. And so, um, starting with video games that that kind of got me hooked and then uh, NBA Jam and then uh, obviously it was a good time to be a Knicks fan back in the in the mid 90s with with Oak and Ewing and uh, and Starks and all them so uh, yeah so I got introduced through through uh, through through video games actually yeah I, I think I remember that Tecmo video game that basketball where you would play and then sometimes when you would take a three-pointer they would do like that motion graphic that like <laughs> <laughs> little cinematography, yep, yep. and that always meant that you were gonna make it in. You know? Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that's when I'd stand up and start cheering. And yep. yep. Yeah. No. The, those are those are some good days for sure. Uh, who who was your, who was your favorite Nick? Was it Oakley or or uh, Ewing? No, I mean I was a Mason guy. I like the nice. I like the uh, point forward. Like that was who I like. I, I I patterned my game after, even though I was you know not built like Mason for sure. But uh, yeah. no, he was my guy. Mace was that guy actually at the, at the time that we we're recording this uh, it was just two days ago it's been nine years since his untimely passing so right, uh, right. rest in peace Anthony Mason he was a fan favorite of mine and many among this Knicks fan base so he he uh, was definitely sorely missed and in terms of the book like like what inspired you to uh, to write the book yeah so uh, I wrote a, an NBA basketball book about the 1970s that came out a few years ago and when I was doing research, there was a line in it in which Peter Vesey, who was writing for the New York Post, uh, referred to the 1979 Knicks uh, with the N-word, right? So it was the first all-black NBA team. And so at the time, I put a little asterisk next to it and was like, look, I need to I need to look into this more. And as I dug a little more, it was like, all right, there's this really cool story about the Knicks. And it's the same time like hip hop is is just emerging from the South Bronx. And so like all this is going on at once. And so... Um, yes, yeah, so that that was kind of what what caught my eye, and then I got to to learn about some of the personalities and the players that played back then, and it was like, yeah, I gotta gotta write this book. So this is your second book because Tall Tale and Short Shorts that was that was your first book, right? So my first book about your, basketball, yeah. your first book about basketball. So what's that research process like? What did, what did the research process entail for this one? Yeah, so this one um, I did. You know, I looked at a bunch of newspapers and and magazines and articles and and stuff. Uh, and then I talked to a couple dozen um, former players, uh, coaches, um, general managers, that sort of thing, just to kind of see what it was like actually in the locker room and on the court with those guys. So this one went a little deeper than just like looking at old newspapers and Sports Illustrated and, and, and books and stuff. So, yeah, it, uh, I started researching in about 2016 and, and wrapped up research about a year ago. So so about seven years worth of, uh, of, of research on this one. You interviewed a number of individuals, Hubie Brown, uh, Bob McAdoo. Who was your favorite uh, of the bunch? So uh, Hubie was amazing um, just because he was, you know, he's sharp as a tag. At 99, uh, man. Right? I know. And, I mean, you would have had no idea on the telephone because it, you know, I, I, I've i got my, I'm fortunate. I've got a couple grandfathers that are still alive and both are both are Hubie's age. Yeah. And, man, I, I talking on the phone is, is hard. But, like, Hubie was sharp and he was on top of things. And so... It was it was pretty amazing to talk to him. He was he was probably my favorite. I also uh, I really enjoyed getting to talk to Jim Clemens, who came over when uh, Walt Frazier left. Uh, Clemens was just a real like real nice guy. Like he was he was happy to to talk forever, and so we exchanged texts back and forth for for quite a while after that. The, the Hubie just he's just a, a relic. He's a national treasure. I mean, I'm I'm watching you know national TV games on ESPN and Hubie Brown breaking the Nick game down to a science, and it's refreshing because you know no offense to certain people in the game, but you know you certain you don't get that commentary everywhere. And for 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 a man 99 years old, a lifer in this game, you know, traveled all over the world, every stop, all cities, being a coach and and calling the game. He he's been an absolute treasure to the game man 
hundred percent, hundred percent. So as you you did your research and your interviews, what was that like? What was a wow moment for you as you're doing your research and, and you you're putting this together? What what was that for you? So the wow moment for me was really like um, getting to you know talking to the players. I think was obviously the, the biggest moment, but the the wow moment for me was when I started to make those connections between like hip hop and and the NBA uh, and just like seeing how the NBA and came to embrace like by the end of the end of the uh, uh, end of the time I'm looking at like by the mid 80s they're starting to embrace hip hop uh, it's becoming popular there the players are listening to it they're going to the clubs and listening to it like that was my aha moment when I was like look I'm not telling two stories I'm telling one story like I'm telling the story of of the significant black culture that's emerging from uh, from not only Madison Square Garden but also the South Bronx from downtown and uptown like that was really my aha moment when it all kind of tied together and it didn't come until like six years in, but but like it was exciting to get there. Yeah, and that's what I really liked in terms of how you wove those, you know, those those changes, those evolutions, kind of together. Where how the Knicks were trying to navigate the post championship years, and and how that genre was just coming out from a time of struggle, a time of survival for for many. And then at the same time, you know, how the, the confluence of those two entities as time goes by in in the book, you you, you kind of weave through as certain times, certain years where you take a look at it from the Knicks point of view. And then what was happening in our time? What was the thought process in terms of how you structured that in the book? Yeah, so I really wanted it to be a story where readers are reminded that, yes, the Knicks are going and, you know, they're having ups, they're having downs, they're getting new players, they're having some excitement, they're changing coaches. But also, like, you can't separate them from the city in which they're playing, right? Like, they're playing in a city that was facing, like, serious economic issues that has, you know, a famous uh, World Series called The Bronx is Burning. Like, you can't separate it from that because the players couldn't separate themselves from that. Like, they're, they're having to play in a city in which... The fans are, are very you know cognizant. They know what's going on with, within their city. And so um, I didn't want to get too far away from the Knicks story, but I felt like there were a lot of times when it was good to kind of take a step back and just say, look, here's what's going on in New York City at the time that these Knicks are trying to win on the court. We've got the son of Sam killer. We've got, you know, the the, the blackout um, uh, rioting in, in 1977. Um, you know, all these things going on that, like, I felt, I felt like couldn't be divorced from the next story. So I didn't want to just give it its own chapter or whatever. I felt that it was good to to, to kind of have readers take a step back and, and see the context that the Knicks were playing in. It's a great story also when you look at it from a Knicks point of view and and especially for Knicks fans who, you know, that older generation who saw that that team and that era, they can reminisce. But for the younger fans, it's really a, a dark and hidden chapter in the franchise's history, because it, it we're always, you know, heralding and rightfully so that 71 and 73 team. And then then we jump right into the Ewing Knicks. You know, yes, we 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 love Bernard and, and the Bernard era, the, all those short was was well loved by the fan base. But then you jump right into Ewing Knicks. But that time for them to try to maintain that championship glory and they're chasing after stars just like they have recently, right? They're after Abdul-Jabbar. They're after Chamberlain. And then the, the Spencer Haywood, McAdoo, they, it's like they went star hunting. We, we talk about star hunting with the Knicks now, but post-championship Knicks, that's exactly how they were trying to position themselves to stay on top. Yeah, it is. And it's funny that, that you mentioned the, the modern Knicks because every, you know, as I was writing the book, there were talks of, you know, is KD going to be a Nick? Is, you know, all these kind of superstars connected to him. And I was like, man, they've been doing this for 40 years now. <laughs> it's never in the changed. 70s, you're doing the same thing. It, it's, it's never changed, man. That When I was reading that segment of the book, I, I just cracked up at all the what <laughs> ifs. And I'm just, I'm wincing in pain. And like, you know, Jabbar <laughs> Chamberlain skipping out on Larry Bird and opted for, for Michael Ray Richardson. I mean, th those times were, were truly epic. And, you know, the, the Spencer Haywood story was was very interesting was there a reason were you able to connect with him or was there a reason why he wasn't able to uh connect for the book yeah so um i i, I got his phone number and i i, I sent some texts I, I called him you know he he didn't answer the phone didn't answer the phone i left messages uh one time he picked up and i you know tried to give him my quick like mr haywood this is dr adam cribbley at southeast Missouri. you know i'm giving him my 30 second elevator pitch and uh i don't remember his exact words but it was basically like 
I don't want to talk to you and, and hung up and, and it was fine. Like I, I get that. And he's, you know, fortunately with Spencer Haywood, he's written a number of, of autobiographies. So you kind of get a sense of what he thought, but yeah, I would have loved to have been able to talk to him just because, I mean, he's such a central story and, or a central character in my story. And, yeah. uh, and it was a shame I wasn't able to connect with him. For sure. And, and he's traded around the same time, you know, Bob McAdoo is another figure who a lot of the older generation always say like, man, if you guys were to see this guy live, I mean, he was an absolute beast. What were your conversations like with, uh, with Bob McAdoo, a well-respected figure on the NBA, even to today? Yeah, he was very gracious. Um, he called me from, I believe it was after heat practice, uh, and he, you know, called me from one of the phones in the offices there and just said, you know, he thanked me for for talking to him like he couldn't have been more gracious. And he was great. Like he was he was great about you know, giving credit to his teammates and uh, and and but also being able to talk candidly and just let me know how much he enjoyed New York and playing in New York City, but also that that it was a challenge and, and that he wishes it would have ended better than it did. Um, but that he was grateful to get the opportunity because of he goes from there to end up. He uh, ends up being um, uh, uh, an important player for the Lakers in their championship run in the 80s. So he was he was very grateful for all the opportunities he had. But yeah, he was um, amazing to talk to. And he's one that like I, I pulled the phone away from my face and uh, I, I like I whispered to my wife. I was like, I'm on the phone with Bob McAdoo. And she's like, I have no idea who Bob McAdoo is. But, but I was really excited about it. Oh, man, that that's very interesting, man. And, you know, another, uh, I think, very poignant theme in the book was or very very key moment in the in this story to me is is uh 79 when the team rolled out the first all black team in the NBA and the sentiment or the perceived sentiment of what that meant to the league as the league was trying to uh recover you know lower attendance lack of interest you had the peter vesey with with his article well, what did you make about that time as as the league and the knicks were, were trying to find that identity that was going to appeal to to all their fans you know that was that was one area that all the players that i talked to kind of downplayed um i think that they were probably tired at the time of hearing it ask you know being asked that question uh, in hindsight, I mean, it's it's a, it's something that we rightfully celebrate, right? That the that the league would have an all black team, um, and at a time again that's so significant in in New York City history. But yeah, I mean, looking back, it's incredibly important. But at the time, it was it was very heavily debated as to whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, uh, because there were there were legitimate questions. Um, you know, owners were concerned about about ticket sales. And ticket sales, as you've mentioned, fan interest in the NBA was dropping. Um, and of course, the easy scapegoat is to say, well, there's too many black faces on the team. Uh, and so that, you know, what what was interesting then um, since then is that like the NBA is growing, you know, the last five to six years is growing, you know, growing across all fan groups um, and and has never been more, you know, more diverse and more you know embracing its diversity than ever before. So it's 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 you know, a little smug looking back and saying, you know, th the owners were wrong, man. If they, if they had embraced that, that difference, but, uh, but yeah, it was an incredibly important time. And, and the way that all of the, all of the front office handled it then and handled it still, when I talked to him recently, um, you know, they said, look, we, we got the 12 best players that we had available. And so until, until we made our final cuts and we trotted them out for the team picture, we really didn't think about the fact that they were an all African American team, but but then I think at the time they even leaned into it and said, this is, you know, this is a good thing. Well, what did you make of the role that media played during that time in terms of depicting the NBA or the perceptions of the NBA? You, you spoke about uh, the polarizing opinions from a Harvey Ayrton to a, to a Peter Vesey. What, what do you think about the way the media was depicting the league during that time based on your research? Yeah, so the, the media was, I, I think, trying to get a handle on why interest in the NBA was was falling. Um, so the two things that they latched on to were drug use and uh, a changing demographic among among players. So players were becoming, you know, the players that were playing were, uh, were more often uh, African-American and there was increased drug use, not only among players, but like celebrities in Hollywood. And so it was, you know, the media was very divisive. I think they were trying to find answers for how to make the league better and more appealing. Uh, it didn't help the NBA that they really lacked a charismatic superstar, maybe for lack of a better term. Um, so the best two players in the NBA for most of this period were probably Dr. J, Julius Irving, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
Uh, neither of which was an incredibly um, engaging personality. Yeah. Uh, Dr. J could be, uh, Kareem could be certainly, but, and then, uh, you know, the, the Knicks had great players, but likewise, Bernard King was not the kind of person who would give colorful interviews. And mm-hmm. so uh, I think the NBA really struggled to find that identity that they could rally around that, of course, in 1980, when Magic and Larry come into the league, like, and then Michael Jordan, and obviously that, that changes. But in this period, it's kind of a transition there. The league and the Knicks are just trying to find their way. You know, from a, from a hip hop angle, I loved the, the various anecdotes as you profiled uh, the various artists uh, from, from Cool Herc, whose original name was a derivation of, of Walt Clyde Frazier. Uh, you know, the formation of Run DMC in, in terms of their early days of playing ball in the park. You know, those, those early days of, of depicting how much, how important basketball, the, the role that basketball played in the formation and the rise of hip hop. How was, how did you find your research uh, when you wrote about that in your book? Yeah. So I started out just kind of thinking, all right, this happens at the same time. But then the more I, I got to look and it was like, all right, they're playing when, when these guys are playing and uh, when, when the hip hop DJs or MCs or whatever you want to call them, when they're playing, they're playing in parks. And the other thing going on in parks is pickup basketball. And so you had this kind of combination of there's basketball, there's there's rap music, there is uh, there are people dancing, there are b-boys and b-girls like dancing to this, and that's all in the same space. And if it's too cold and they go inside, they go inside to a basketball gym uh, to to play their 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 shows. And so like the they're always sharing the same space. And so I, I you know I guess I was surprised at first, then later not surprised to see that basketball brought a lot of them together and that. These are, are especially young men, but young women as well that loved playing basketball. They love they love music. And so they kind of grew up hand in hand. And so the the spaces that they're using are, are really the same for both. And so there was a lot of overlap. Well, one of uh, one of my guys who you mentioned several times in the book is the legend, the rhyme animal, Chuck D. He's he's uh, the, the biggest champion of Knicks fan TV every night when we do our post game shows. He's in the chat vibing amongst the people but he's in there as chuck d the knicks fan not not sure. chuck d the icon and and uh, you know i love his humility in that way but what i i love doing these pieces this histor- these historic pieces especially as it relates to the culture because his name is always in that midst in a number of interviews i've done and and i've, I've made it a conscious effort that way because i want the younger fans to really understand his impact on the culture, I mean, and, and we talk as we talk about the game and the culture and that confluence, Chuck D's stamp on it was right up there, man. I mean, he was oh, truly yeah. a pillar to the culture. Yep, absolutely. No, and and, and he was a no, one of a number of 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 you know, early and, and pioneering hip hop stars that really kind of embraced embraced that connection of basketball and and obviously a lot of it's coming out of New York. So a lot of them are, are Knicks fans and a lot of them are embracing the Knicks and uh, then you start to have the rivalry between Knicks fans and Lakers fans that over, you know, hip hop's in the mix of that. And it's it's interesting to me to see that kind of a, a, a big rivalry from the, the 60s and early 70s that continues and then becomes kind of part of the hip hop thing as well. But no, you're right. Like some of those some of those early hip hop artists were were incredibly important in that not only the like the Knicks culture, but also that sense of like basketball and playground ball and all that was was really central to it. For sure, for sure. And, it, you know, in the book, I, I thought what was also interesting was as you start at the NBA in the 79 era, really trying to find its identity towards, you know, a mass audience, hip hop was kind of doing the same thing in terms of both of these traditionally black art forms trying to branch out and appeal to a wide audience. And you yeah. spoke about it from your perspective, what it meant to you as a kid. And what, what did you think about, you know, how both of those mediums and those platforms was ultimately able to branch out to, to white America and to younger white audience to really tap into their fandom? Yeah. And so what, what happens, of course, is that these are these are powerful, like local forces. Obviously, basketball's you know, growing in popularity at that time. Uh, but hip hop was was one of those things that just seemed. Um, almost counterculture. So it seemed like one of those, you know, again, in my household, my parents wanted nothing to do with, with hip hop or rap. And it's not that they said I couldn't listen to it, but you know, it was more turn that crap off and listen to it in your own bedroom <laughs> yeah, kind of thing, yeah. uh, which made me like it even more. And so I think that it became uh, a way for um, 
especially again for for white suburban kids like me at the time to to really kind of you know embrace that that culture and that that different uh culture that was that was interesting and, and different and uh and basketball was the same thing like i you know played basketball for years and years and years and the uh just embracing that kind of playground showman style of basketball was something that also comes out from that time period because this is you know an nba that in the 1970s was accused of being kind of boring uh whereas the american basketball association the aba was exciting and high flying and so this is a period of, of transition in the nba too where it's like all right we're going to embrace that that high flying athletic style of play and and that of course is going to trickle down to two people that are you know like me that are that aren't aren't in new york city and aren't like part of this underground hip-hop movement once again we're talking to adam cribley he's the author of the new book kings of the garden the new york knicks and their city will be available on april 15th so make sure you guys go out there and get it it's a great book i've gone through it and it's uh it's a really fantastic read to give you that that perspective both as a knicks fan a basketball fan and you know whether you're you're currently living in new york city or used to live in new york city or you remember those days it's a it's a very very great look back on the history of this city and the tumultuous times the tumultuous times for sure and and adam as you you compile all this research everything's not going to make the book was that what was you know whether one or two th things that you really wanted to get in there but it's a you know battle between you and the editor to make the final cut <laughs> yeah my, my editors were great um but in every case there's there's stuff that had to be cut and yeah. so one thing one thing that i really enjoy is a lot of that context like what's going on at the time what what music is playing? Um, like, what are the popular songs? And and my editor did say a couple times, like, yeah, we need to, you know, we need to we need to kind of cut some of that. So um, I will say that that one thing I was glad my editor cut was so in in an initial draft I had uh, I had written it so Hubie Brown suffered a heart attack uh, in the midst of one of the seasons, and at the time the the most popular song on the radio was Total Eclipse of the Heart, and I was like, well, I mean. That you know, hearts were hearts were on everybody's mind in New York City, and I was glad that they uh, they told me to to maybe cut that, yeah, to, to not make that. But uh, I mean, there were there were there was there there weren't a lot of stories that didn't make uh, didn't make the final cut. But um, for sure, it would have been the context and like what movies were popular at the time, and uh, and so we did we did cut a little bit of that. But yeah, most of the most of the good stuff stayed. That, that, that's excellent, man. And uh, how about today's team? Have, have you been tapping in with today's team? What, what, what's been your thoughts? Yeah, no, they're. I mean, they're so much fun to watch, and uh, when they're when they're healthy, when they're healthy, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But but it got me to thinking. So so one thing I like, you know, I don't like the game of could so and so have played back in the day, or could so and so from back in the day play now. But man, when I watch when I watch Julius Randle, I get Spencer Haywood vibes. Mm. Like they just they had a similar attacking style. Uh, at, at the rim, um, you know, Spencer was Spencer was not necessarily ripped to the level of, of, of Julius Randle, but but was still a very you know, muscular guy. Um, I, I've been excited to see Jalen Brunson uh, take a step from where he was at Dallas. Uh, you know, I, I still have still have uh, high hopes for Precious um, that that he can. Uh, and he, see, he's another one that I think would have fit in really well because long distance shooting wasn't a big part of the game. And so yeah. attacking the rim, playing playing defense. Yeah. Like. Um, yeah, and, uh, and you know, again, to my my video game roots, uh, Mitchell Robinson's one of my favorite centers on NBA 2K. So, uh, so yeah, no, I the the modern team is uh, is exciting. It's great to see excitement back in in Knicks yeah. land, and I'm hoping that they they turn it around. Even Josh Hart, man, sometimes he gives me like modern day Mason vibes. The the way that he yeah, plays, yeah. you know, it, it's sure. always a struggle from the outside, but he's <laughs> as physical as they come. He's always going downhill and attacking, and kind of that relentless motor. Kind of reminds it, and and a guy who always is sacrificing. He's he's guarding big men. He's guarding smaller guys. That was kind of Mason as well. Well, a very versatile forward. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Now that's another good another good connection for sure. Yeah, for for sure. As you look towards the future with this team, we we won't know what what uh, what the present might hold. They're very injured right now, but hopefully they get it together. Is there a piece out there that that you want to see? them go after they went after og ananobi he's he's here mm -hmm. and that yep. you know they made a a minor trade by the deadline but what do you want to see from this team long term yeah i mean I, you know I, i'd love to see a big a big like superstar in new york like they just they haven't had that and i and again looking back at, at my book and stuff they've 
they've swung and missed for for a number of years. So I mean, I don't know if I don't know if Giannis that kind of piece is 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 the kind of guy, and obviously that would elevate them to a probably to a different level. But yeah, I mean, I I would just love to see someone with that star power in in New York. Um, you know, maybe somebody that can that can create can help Brunson a little bit, but. Uh, but again, I'm I'm a, a big fan of the old school. Like the Knicks need a don, you know a ball handling Mark Jackson like point guard. So uh, yeah, no, I I, I think you know uh, somebody some some big name that can bring a lot more attention back to the Big Apple would be would be good. A- absolutely, man. And and so uh, finally, as this book comes out on on April fifteenth, you know what what do you want the readers to take away uh, from from this book? Yeah, so really two things. I want readers to understand that there was a there was a Knicks team that played between, uh, you know, 1973 and 1985. That <laughs> those guys existed, and uh, and also that like there's more to just basketball than what's going on on the court. The the connections that happen between basketball and New York City and the people that are living there and the the music and the culture is all all there. And so the the impact that basketball has on the culture and the culture has on basketball is is something else I'd like uh, like readers to take away. There you go, man. Well, excellent job, and you know, hopefully, when you when you release the next book, you you come back on the show, or, or when the Knicks make the playoffs, we'd love to have you on again, man. This was an excellent conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, good luck and uh, continued success to you. Thank you so much, CP. Thank you for having me on. Indeed. <laughs>